God in coming from the Word of God to, to talk to me, to talk to me, to show me how I deal with difficult things. And for those of you that are interested in titles to help you gear up and think about the subject, I'm calling this Struggles That Strengthen. Can we say it together? One, two, three. Struggles that... Yeah, see, we don't want struggles, but God uses them on purpose to cause our faith to be activated and to discover where we really are. You don't know what you got until you're under pressure. It's easy to be a happy, clappy little Christian when everything's going fine. What happens when it hits the fan? Where's your faith then? But struggles were not sent to hurt you. They were sent to build you and make you a stronger follower of Jesus and have a greater impact in the kingdom of God. I said that better than you said amen. Okay, okay, just kidding. So here we are. We're still in verse 1. No, just kidding. Here we go. Now I rejoice in what was suffered for you and I fill up my flesh what is still lacking in regard to Christ's afflictions For the sake of his body, which is the church. So what he's telling us is I am suffering and I am being buffeted and I'm being being a blessing to the church of Jesus Christ. And you're going to suffer if you love the name of Jesus too. If you think this is going to be a free ride and this is just a big ticket to happy, happy land, you're, you're going to face some struggles. God, Because, you know, the moment you say yes to Christ, you enter into a battle. Because you're, you're trying to swim upriver. You're, you're, uh, today in our world, like never before, we are, as believers are trying to swim against the tide. And it's getting stronger and stronger against us. So this is a prophetic word as well because you will see, if you love Jesus and you stand for Jesus, it's not going to get easier, it's going to get harder. He's going to shake the church, allow the church to be shaken. And how many of you say, when it's shaken, I want to still be standing because I'm on the rock Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. So we need to face reality. It isn't going to get warmer and you know, fuzzier. It's going to get tougher. But don't be fearful because Jesus said, I've overcome the world. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Come on. Amen. Glory to God. This old boy's getting a little excited here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, so he continues on and uh, talks about this, this suffering and he rejoices that he can suffer because he knows that God is using those difficult things to strengthen the church and strengthen Paul. It says, uh, I have become a great apostle that everyone should bow down to. Oh, hold on. What was it? That's not the Amplified. <laughs> Verse 25, I have become a what? A oh, come on, church. What? A servant. a servant. By the commission of God, God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness. And then he talks about it, this this mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the saints. It was a mystery, but when the Lord came and what he did on the cross, he changed everything from that which seemed hidden And he became Lord of all, and he became my Lord, and he is the Lord of everything. And the secret mystery is Christ in you. He's not out there anymore bringing down, you know, tablets. The Holy Spirit and Christ is in you. And you know what? We get in on it because it was pretty much for the Jews. They they saw themselves, and they were a unique people of God. But now Christ is in the Gentiles. We get to get in on this. It's not just for the Israelis. We're in on it too. And and they they didn't particularly like that at the time. They they were very exclusive. But you know what? The Lord loves everyone. He died for the whole world. And I'll get ahead of myself and say this. So what right do we have to pick and choose who can get fellowship with us? Come on. He let you in and he let me in, so what's the problem, huh? Hallelujah. Man, I've got to be careful here. I'm preaching. (laughs) So he says this mystery, verse 27, To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery. And the mystery is the gospel. Christ in us. 
This mystery which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom so that we may present everyone perfect. You might go, well, I'm not in that crowd. <laughs> perfect means mature. To, to the Jewish thought, perfection was when you did what you were expected to do. When you lived up to what the standard was, what Christ is telling you to become. And then he goes on and he says, um, to this end I labor, and here's that word again, struggling with all his energy which so powerfully works in me. His energy is in you. And when it seems like it's tough and you're not going to make it, just remember where your strength comes from. Amen? Amen. At your, your extremity, you know, is God's opportunity. When you're weak, then the Bible says you can be strong. Yeah. The contrast is amazing. In fact, the quicker you realize how weak you are, the bigger blessing you're going to receive. Because you'll get back out of the way and let God come through. You there? Okay, now continuing on, chapter 2. I want you to know, here he repeats it, how much I am struggling for you. When was the last time you struggled for someone else? Did that go over well? You know, we, we want to avoid struggles. We want to avoid pain. We don't, want, we don't even want to talk about suffering. In, in this amazing world of medicine and, and miraculous medical you know, inventions, and it's all great because it takes pain away. And, and I'm not telling you we all look forward to pain, but the fact is we've been trained in our brain how to find relief from pain. Yeah. But life is filled with it. And life is all about the striving and the struggle and the difficulty. Jesus took the ultimate pain for us. But we are going to continue. If you're a follower of Christ, you're going to walk as he walked and you're going to experience many of the things that he did. And, and if you think Christianity is a free, freedom from struggle and sacrifice and suffering... I've got news for you. If you follow the Jesus that I know, he suffered and the scripture says, and you will suffer too. That's true. This whole process of Christianity is null dying and Jesus coming forth. And dying is not fun. In fact, my, my person has been working at it for 75 years and I'm still struggling with dying. Do you understand what I'm talking about? It's a dying process where Noel decreases and Jesus increases. And that hurts. When the Lord puts his finger on something that you hardly realize in your life, and you thought you were just tracking along, hallelujah, I'm a blessed Christian. And the Lord goes, eh, and you go, what? Ooh, I don't like that. So I want you to know how much I'm struggling for you and for those at Laodicea, and for all who have not met me personally. He said, now, this is a letter, remember. And when they got this letter, Epaphras or whoever was the leader would stand in front of the people and read it to them. And they didn't stop and take time over every point like I am. How many of you have ever read a letter? Dear Noel, it's so good to, sit, to know that you're doing well. And then in brackets. Now, what I mean by doing well, is, and then you extrapolate all the words that are... You, we don't, you don't read a letter like that. You read the whole thing. And then it, whatever piqued your interest, you go back and, oh, what, what did he mean by that? That's, that's what we're doing today. We're, we're reading that which the Holy Spirit put in Paul's heart so that they would understand that the struggle was not the end of the story. My purpose is that they met, the, and the, he's saying his purpose is that the church, Colossians, the Colossae people would be encouraged in heart. How many think there's room for that? And united in love. This church has such an amazing future ahead. Amen. Because Jesus is here. And, and when he's around, great stuff happens. Amen. Great rejoicing, but also great opposition. Because the darkness doesn't like the truth and the light. Encouraged in heart, united in love. Are you united in love? Amen. Pastor Elisa a while ago just challenged us about, you know, I oh, didn't like the music. And, you know, <laughs> we're not here for you. 
I know that's a surprise. We're not even singing to you. We're singing to one. And so when you come in, you don't get concerned about the details. You, you could sit out in the grass on a picnic blanket and be blessed out of your socks because you're worshiping Jesus. Amen? So he goes on and he says, I want you to unite, be united in love so that you may have the full riches of complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, Christ, in whom, in Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. You want wisdom and knowledge? Get a hold of Jesus and get him in as close to you as you possibly can. Amen. And I tell you this, that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Pause. He was dealing with heresy. He was dealing with Gnosticism, which was an emphasis on knowledge. He was dealing with exclusivity and my little group that knows more than you do. And if you want to get spiritual, you've got to be part of our group, you know. How many know the enemy loves to break off little groups in the church? Then yeah. then they feel superior to everybody else. And if you want to enjoy our group, you have to follow our rules. That's satanic. Yeah. And and that's what was some of that was going on. Come come with us and we'll give you unique. You'll have a, you won't be part of the crowd. You'll be a special little group. And so he goes on and says, "Don't let them deceive you by these fine-sounding arguments." For though I'm absent from you in body, I am present with you in spirit and delight to see how orderly... They were having problems, but he still encouraged them. There is no end to encouragement. You can be going through stuff. The church can be going through stuff. But Paul, even in the midst of their struggles, encouraged them by saying, I really want to commend you for the way you are functioning, your orderliness, the way you conduct yourself, and firm in your faith in Christ. How many say, I know sometimes it feels like it's all caving in, but boy, I just love to come to the house of the Lord and worship with God's people and sense the Spirit's encouragement. Amen. You know, people who don't fellowship are in danger of discouragement. We, we need to be here. We need to be together. We need to share. We need to pray. We need to build each other up and walk arm in arm together. And when one starts dragging, we've got your arm. We'll drag you along with us until you do better. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Well, that was a good scripture. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Don't you clap? I heard someone clapping. <laughs> so I, I don't have to quit till like 12 o'clock, right? I've got another hour. Okay. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> I have to go to their, their house after this, so I better not be messing around. <laughs> you know, I just want to throw this in. <clears throat> Tertullian, who was a a, a, a theologian way, way back centuries ago made this statement. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. I hate to bring that up, but think about that. It was through the loss, the horrendous loss of believers that were cruelly treated. You know, 70 AD when the Colosseum was up and running, it wasn't a football match. And Christians were being slaughtered wholesale. And the blood of those Christians was scattered all over the floor of the arena. The blood of the martyrs are the seed of the church. Can I submit to you that that is a, a warning for us that there is a cost in serving Jesus. And you know what? As this pressure from this so-called woke society and all the hell that's breaking loose. Do you sometimes say to your wife or your husband or your friend, we've all gone mad. We just cannot believe what's happening around us. But see, we're, we're in the last days. Yeah. And as the, as the Spirit of God begins to move in power, the enemy knows his time is getting short and he's going to fight like never before. But it's going to take Christians who understand that in, there's going to be struggles and suffering Maybe not to the degree that I'm talking about in the arena, but who knows? But, but all I know is this. They can mess with your body, but they can't touch your spirit and your soul. And we have a home in heaven forever and ever and ever and ever. Yeah. Absent from the body, present with the Lord. Amen? Amen? So, you know, just be encouraged. Just be encouraged. So my experience has been when the church... 
when, when the church is tested, it flourishes. Because the real people step up and the flakes fall away. I mean, anyone can come in a building and sing songs and say Jesus. That doesn't mean you're a Christian. Christ in you is what makes you Christian. And Christ in you each and every day. And it's not because we're better than anybody else. We're just, be- we're forgiven. Hallelujah. I mean, are you there? So what I'd say is if the church flourishes when tested, the warning is, does it shrivel in prosperity and ease? And I'd submit to you that often when things are just okie-dory and everything's fine, it's so easy just to kind of kick into automatic and take for granted the things that are around us that God has blessed us with. And will you be continually serving the Lord when some of those things fall away? Psalms 137 verse 4. I won't quote it perfectly. It's just a short verse. But it's, it's when the people were taken away from Jerusalem, their beautiful, lovely city and their home and God and the temple and all of that. And they were taken into Babylon. Much of the city destroyed and they were taken away into an ungodly place. And the verse says something like this. Will you be able to sing the song of the Lord in a foreign land? Can you let your brain think on that one? So the question here is, what, what's a foreign land to you and me? It's a land of loss. It's a land where we've lost loved ones, where we've lost friends. It's a land, the foreign land is when the job goes away. When the income is tight, when we have to pull up and move and go to a place that we didn't expect to go. Foreign land is a place that's dry and desert. And these that were taken from their homeland and placed in this foreign land, there was, if you read it in context, it's like somebody in Babylon is kind of sort of harassing them. You know, sort of challenge the oh, well, you're going to sing the song of the Lord now? You're not in Jerusalem, you're here. You're where you didn't want to be. And so the question today, along with this, is under struggles and testing, where Paul actually said, I rejoice in it because I know that out of it, God's going to bless his church. We're going to be better than we were before. We're not going to be defeated. We're going to be victorious. We're going to, we're, he's going to be our champion. Hallelujah. So remember, blood of the martyrs, seed of the church. And throughout the centuries, the church has been attacked. And the enemies tried to wipe it off the face of the planet. But we're still here. Hallelujah. We're still here. Amen. I'm not, I'm not going to be afraid of struggles. Listen, you and I could write books about our struggles. Yeah. As pastors, you struggle in ways that a lot of people have no idea. I'm not asking for, it's not a pity party. I'm just telling you, when you're out in the front lines raising up the name of Jesus, you are a target. And so are you as just followers of Jesus. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. It is a fight of faith. And the enemy will throw every kind of curve at you. Ask uh, Job. He had a few. But he didn't quit. No, he didn't. <laughs> How many say, if Jesus can go through what he did and have me in mind, then I'm going to keep my eyes on Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. Amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand. So in verse 24 that we read, he said, I rejoice in what was suffered for you. He rejoiced in it because he saw the bigger picture. He talks about his struggles and his toil and his suffering and his pain. You know, some churches wouldn't even want you to do that because that's just not a negative, that's a negative confession. Got to just be positive. No, Paul was positive that he struggled and suffered and went through it all. Come on. How many know we got to be honest? But see, when when you talk about the negative stuff that hits us, it doesn't wipe us out. It just drives us closer to the one who has the answer. Gosh, so amazing. Verse 29, to this end I labor, struggling. He didn't say, oh, I just, I'm on this easy street with Jesus. 
I've been forgiven. I killed Christians, but now I'm going to go to heaven. It's all a piece of cake. No, I labor, struggling with all his energy, powerfully working in me. Where was his focus when he was in prison, in, in the Mamertine jail? You know, he was in a place where all, this sounds terrible, but, you know, when you're in jail for months or years, bodily stuff has to go somewhere. You, you know, there were not, you know, showers and nice little toilets, and it all went from the top shelf, top floor down. People were just, it was filth and disgusting. And in that midst, he wrote letters to encourage the church. And even though he was up to his eyeballs in mess and pain and loneliness, and it'd be so easy to think, well, if this is a God of love, what am I doing here? How could this happen to me? Jesus was not the favorite of the season, you know? And he said hard things. You know what? If I'd have been Jesus' PR man, I would have told him to tone it down. Are you tracking me? Are you with me? Yeah, Pia, I, I want you to succeed, Jesus. Don't say things like, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no part of me. Whoa, don't do that. That, that thins the crowd. If Jesus is all about getting the crowd, he, you wouldn't know it because of the things he said. To the religious leaders, we were talking about it on the way to church this morning. You are your father the, of your father the devil. Whoa, no, Lord, don't do that. Don't say that. There's a better way to do it. He was not trying to curry favor. He came as the truth to set us free. Amen. We should never be afraid of challenge and truth. And when it hurts and it pierces our heart and soul, rejoice because that means health is on the way. Amen. And fruitfulness and all that good stuff. You can't enjoy the mountain if you don't go through the valley. You've got to get there some way. Amen. I'm blessing myself. I hope you got blessed. <laughs> so, listen, the life of a Christ follower, follower is not for the weak. And it has no autopilot. Just when you think you've got it all dialed in, it's going to change. Nothing is automatic in the Christian life. It's a fight of faith. And suffering is unavoidable if you choose to live out the gospel in Jesus' name, it's unavoidable. But we're not saying, yay, bring it on, hit me again, I love it, you know? No, 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 we're not talking about that. But we're talking about it is inevitable that as our Savior was challenged and our Savior was rejected, he even said words like this, I'm sorry to tell you, but if they hated me, they probably hate you too. Because, you, you know, you're talking light in a place of darkness. And when you go to work someplace or you're in college or school and you let the light shine, the enemy is going to try and dump on you. So the question is, can you sing the song of the Lord? Now, what that basically just means is praise and worship, as we know. Can you praise and worship in a foreign place? Are you today? Are you? In the midst of your pain, in the midst of your loss... Can you still sing the song of the Lord? Now, that's to do with Paul's labor. Now, let's talk about his commission. And that'll help us get, get, get light on what was going on in Paul's life as it does with us. Acts chapter 9, verse 15. You, you, you're following me? should have the scripture. Now, this is the very calling and the beginning of Paul. It should have actually made him aware that this is not going to be a cakewalk, you know? Look at this. But the Lord said to Ananias, as a little disciple in Damascus, go down to see this man, and that was going to be Saul, as he was called then, and became Paul. Go and see this man. He is my chosen instrument. How many go, that's the time to rejoice. I'm a chosen instrument. Yay! Wait on, it's not finished yet. To carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel and I will show him how awesome it's going to be. I'm going to show him what? I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name. Now God wasn't getting back at him because he was mean to Christians. This is not vengeance. 
But this is helping him understand that you're going to go on a pathway and I've anointed you and given you a message and it's going to bring about pain. It's not going to be easy. I don't know of anyone in the New Testament that suffered probably less or more rather than, than Paul. So that's the, if you want to know how it all began, that's how it began. I mean, I don't like suffering. No. You said I'd be blessed if I became a Christian. I still got troubles. You ain't seen nothing yet. And Paul went through it. I mean, the scripture, if you want to, look, if you want to do a study that really is reality, look up concordance or go to your, go to your, uh, computer and look up suffering struggling pain and you will see the bible is loaded with scriptures to make us aware look christians are not trying to escape from reality christians are being prepared for reality that was a good word i where did that come from i don't know <laughs> christianity is not running from reality it's being prepared for reality it's not an escape mechanism from pain but it is into the arms of God who has it all under his control. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Things may look bleak, but I'm still a victorious Christian, and I'm still going to win in the end. Yeah. Matthew 16, 24. Let's have a, a shot at that. Ready? Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone would come after me, or in other words, if anyone wants to be my disciple... Let him receive everything he's ever dreamed of. <laughs> Let him be the center of attention. May all good things only come... I mean, come on. If you want to follow me, you must what? Deny. Oh, come on. I know you don't like the word, but I want to hear it. What is it? Deny. Is that sacrifice? Yes. Is, is that pain? Yes. When did you last have to deny yourself because of how you cared for somebody else when did you decide not to sit and relax at home after a hard day's work but you felt the Lord said go over to Mary or go over to John or go to their house just go and pray for them tell them you love them you don't have to go in with sermon notes just go and be kind deny what you preferred in order to be a blessing to somebody else and guess what there's a wave of blessing coming right behind you because as you give it's given back to you Deny yourself and, oh no, take up his cross and follow me. The cross is an instrument of death, right? Some people think Christians are weird. We carry crosses, the execution stuff on our chests like it's a magic, a rabbit's foot or something. I mean, that instrument represents pain and death and agony. That's what Jesus did for you and for me. The cross is not a little neat piece of jewelry. It represents death and then life for us. Yeah. For whosoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. Yeah. Isn't it interesting how God has everything upside down? You want to get, you give. You want to grow, you die. Pain and suffering is inherent. You know, don't be, don't be deceived. These are not my sermon notes. <laughs> it's going to get longer than that. <laughs> Christ's message calling for sacrifice is a, it, it's a tough territory. Someone said this, and I, I wish it was me, but I like it. So the test becomes your testimony. Yes. Isn't that good? How many of you have a testimony because of the test that you went through? Come on, honestly. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I wish it could be a different way. You know? I could tell you stories about Elisa, and I won't. <laughs> but before she met Gareth and while she was in Australia going through... Hillsong Bible College and youth ministries and stuff. She had a lot of tests and trials. Painful relationship things. 
but she's sitting here glorifying God and serving him as one of his shepherds because she stuck with the stuff. And now God brought them together and now they're part of a wonderful family and there's great things ahead. Isn't it amazing? It's not easy. She has a testimony because of the test. So is Gareth. And you know that Gareth and his family have been through a huge test in the last year or so. But he's sitting here giving glory to Jesus and he knows where God is leading and he knows where his loved ones are and he's moving on. Come on! It's not easy. And every one of you could stand up and give that testimony. Childbirth. Never experienced it. Don't have any desire to. Of course, society would tell me that I can. You know, <laughs> God help me. <laughs> How dumb is that? <laughs> I complain like I'm dying when I have a little gas. <laughs> Carol says, moving on. <laughs> Just one step too far. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. <laughs> She's my girl. <laughs> but, but you know, um, our other daughter, Michelle, uh, quick story, but once again, pain, suffering, anguish, heartbreak, and something glorious comes out of it. Yeah. You know, she, she was pregnant uh, with her, son, her first child, and she had an abruption. We're living in Phoenix. She started bleeding profusely. The doctor said that she would have died if she hadn't got to the hospital in time. And then they told her she'd never be able to, they've never brought a child out of a cesarean that, with a mother that's lost all that blood and the child even live, let alone her. Then the child lived and we went through all the pain and agony of that. And then we find out that this little boy is severely, severely autistic. And all the hopes and dreams to have a, a, a child that would give love and share love and, and be able to communicate and all that goes with that is gone. Just gone. He's 23 years old now and he's made huge progress, but he'll always be with them and always need them and always live with them. And out of the pain and all of the disbelief of how could this happen, what's going to, why, and all of that. And then out of a long story short, she started training this little boy in her basement and learning about autism because nobody knew anything about it back then. And she educated herself and she helped him. And then her mom found out she was doing it and brought, came and said, can you show me what to do? I have an autistic child. And then another mother joined in the basement. Now the ma- basement... They ended up taking a suite in one of the buildings that we had as a community center at our church. And then out of that, she got another room. And then she said, Dad, when they leave, I'd like that room. Now they have the entire three-story building. And all of it is one of the most powerful autistic training centers in the whole of the United States. (laughs) Out of all that pain. Now, Michelle wouldn't say, well, I'm a hero. She'd go, do you believe this? In fact, she didn't even want kids. First time someone stuck a baby in her arm, she said it felt like a caterpillar wriggling around. She, you know, God gave her the desire to have children, but at the beginning, no way. And then she has this child. But then somehow out of the ashes of pain and suffering, God brings something miraculous. And now hundreds of kids are being blessed as a result of that pain. Don't you underestimate the tough thing you go through. Because somehow the Lord will heat up the life and circumstances to a boiling point. But it'll get rid of all the dross and it'll be like pure gold. Thank you, Jesus. Don't you just love him? Can we raise our hands and just be thankful? Lord, we thank you that even through the pain and the tough times, we're not giving in. Because we know, Lord, that greater is he that is in us than he that's in the world. And I won't fight you, Lord. I yield to you and I accept. You'll show me the difference between my own silly decisions that bring about consequences that have nothing to do with you. But, but Lord, even then, I'll trust you. Come on. Amen, church? Amen. Praise God. Amen. Turn to the person next to you and say, that is good stuff. I've lost complete track of time. I've always been like this. What, what have we got? Ten minutes now? What? till midnight it is not 
Am I already done? Do I have time? Oh, I, I'm not kidding. I, I forgot. What? I got 10 minutes? Eight minutes. Okay. Okay. Well, let's just have coffee and close in prayer. And <laughs> okay. Now, this is, the, I, I, I'm going to jump. I don't have time to go through all the scriptures I plan to. Um, this is probably a two month teaching. I always have way more material than I have. I've been doing this for 50 years and I still have more material every Sunday than I ever need, you know. That's how pastors create uh, series. We, we, we get down rabbit trails, we talk, we get spontaneous, and suddenly what was a wit, one sermon, one week sermon turns into three months. Yeah, yeah, I'll be back next week. <laughs> I like this. Are you ready? This little boy, listen, he says, don't be like the little boy during World War II said, I wouldn't mind going off to war like my dad and being a hero if I knew it wouldn't, I wouldn't get hurt. If you're going to serve Jesus, there will be times that you get hurt. In fact, sometimes those that should know better and are closer to you as brothers and sisters can hurt the worst because you didn't expect it to come from. But they are in pain too, just like you. So don't blame them too much. And if you want to take a list of all the people you've hurt, maybe we'll just shut up and forget about it and leave it alone. Amen. Amen. Love you. <laughs> it is possible to escape a multitude of trouble if you want to live an insignificant life. Isn't that something? How about say it? Run that by me one more time. It is possible to escape a multitude of trouble. By living an insignificant life. I'm just going to go along, not make waves, not give my opinion. Just, yeah, I'm a yes person. I believe in, oh, that's right. Yeah, what, I agree with that. Yeah. You start telling everybody you agree with them and all they'll start talking to each other and then they'll discover that you believe nothing because you just say yes. We need to be people with conviction, but we need to be loving people and forgiving people. Amen? Amen? And here's one more quote. C.S. Lewis was one of my uncles. Not true. God whispers to us in our joys, speaks to us in our difficulties, and shouts to us in our pain. How many say, if I'm going to hear God shouting, the chances are I'm going to be going through it. But he doesn't run away from us. He shouts to us in our pain as he teaches us the way to go. Closing, jumping to the last set of verses that I wanted to read to you. This is such good stuff. Yeah. Colossians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, guys, if you want to jump over to the last scriptures. So then, Paul says, just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Or live in him. So then, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, how many of you receive Jesus as Lord in your life? Come on, put your hand up. Okay, good. If you haven't, he's waiting for you. He's right here today. In fact, he's knocking on your heart's door right now. He's as close to you as you'll ever be because he loves you. So we're not asking you to join a club and try to be a nice person because none of us are. But we are forgiven. And Jesus knows the worst about us and loves us anyway. So as you receive Jesus the Lord, continue to live in him. This is how you live in him, rooted like a tree that sends its roots way down. And when the storms in the Midwest come where we live and the winds blow, the tree stands because it's deeply rooted, just like you do in your life. And, and, and built up in him and strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thanks. My point on this is, here we go. Stop complicating Christianity. Amen. Stop trying to figure it all out. Yes. Hear carefully. Just as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him. Amen. How you started is how you keep going. How did you receive Jesus the Lord? Number one, you repented. Keep repenting. Don't build up your pride. 
The scripture is loaded with things like repent or you perish. Repent and turn to the Lord so your sins will be washed and wiped away. Repent, repent means I'm heading this way, but it's a military term and it means about face. It doesn't mean I'm heading this way and I do a 360 and go right back to where I started. It's a 180. Repent means I'm heading this way and the Lord calls me to a new beginning and I turn and I put that behind me and I go forward. Now, that's what you keep doing. Don't try to control your problems. Repent and go with the Lord in the other direction. As you received him, so walk in him. How about humility and obedience? Why do people build up their pride again after they've humbled themselves and been forgiven? You didn't have anything going for you then, but now you do. But don't try to go back to that. Well, now I'm just spiritual and I'm proud in the Lord. (laughs) Proud in the Lord. I smell a funny odor around proud in the Lord. Are you there? As you received Christ Jesus, how did you do it? You repented and then you became humble and you obeyed him. If you love me, Jesus said, don't just shout hallelujah, do what I say. Ouch. So I'm not going to complicate Christianity by trying to sweat it up and learn a thousand scriptures overnight and and prove to everybody that I'm the spiritual giant. I received him by repenting. I'm going to stay in repentance. I'm going to ask the Lord to forgive me every day when he puts his finger on something. Oh, yes, we walk in forgiveness. I know that. But that doesn't change the fact that we need to have a repentant heart because pride gets in so easily. And so we repent, we obey, we humble ourselves. I received him that way. Shouldn't be too complicated. I just keep doing what I did when I came to him in the first place. Is that good? Yes. Amen. Amen. Well, I just turned off my microphone, so I'm done. <laughs> Love you guys. Love you Thank you, Jesus. So are you willing to keep singing the song of the Lord in the dry land and in the foreign place and in the hard times? Can I listen? You're going to get a test of this message real fast. You're going to have an opportunity to exercise it, not just go, yahoo, that was a good word. Now when it hits the fan in the next six weeks, six months, six days, six hours, the Lord's not trying to hurt you. He's trying to grow you. He's trying to say, if you want to be closer to me, I'm going to give you an opportunity to get closer to me. And we'll, we'll take you through this and you're going to come out stronger. Amen. And you'll have a testimony. Amen. Amen. Can we pray? Lord, thank you for the privilege of being with your sheep, your, your church, your leaders. Thank you for the awesome years of mercy and grace that you've given Carol and I. As we get older, we just just get carried away with your mercy. How you would take me and bring me to a godly woman and change my world. Lord, you didn't take away the pain. You didn't take away the difficulties. But through it all, you're bigger than you used to be to me. I pray, Lord, for this congregation. There's great, mighty challenges and things ahead. And it's not going to happen because just a few people do it all. It's going to take every one of us to step up and give ourselves to your purpose so that Coastland's life will bring life to thousands of people across the coastlands. For those that are here today, Lord, that have been through pain, that have been in the foreign place, and want to constantly continue to sing the praises and the song of the Lord. I pray for an infusion of your power and your strength, for an inspir- a spirit of encouragement to rise up within them. And when they see things that are difficult, Lord, let them realize that real faith is when it makes no sense, we still trust you. 
for all of those in this room today that just need to step up into that world. Say, Lord, no matter what comes, I'm going to keep singing your song. Keep trusting you. Keep moving forward. Keep expecting great things. If that's your prayer this morning, would you just raise your hand all over the auditorium? This is your prayer between you and Jesus. I can't help you. you. Jesus has to do it. Raise it up. You're willing to go through and come out on the other side. God bless so many of your hands are up, Lord. Bless them as they step into a new beginning. And with your hands down right now, if you're here this morning and you've never fully asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, I don't mean you've got religion. I don't mean, you know, you may be as fully sincere and as wonderful as person that you can be. But without Jesus, we're lost. He didn't die on the cross for nothing. He died because we needed him. We needed our sins to be forgiven. We needed to have a new beginning. And he's here this morning. He says, where two or three are gathered in your name, I'm here in the midst. If, that, if you're here and you say, look, I, I'm not saying I want to join the church here. I'm not saying I want to turn over a new leaf. But I want a living relationship with Jesus Christ so that he's as real to me at home as he is in the cathedral or he is wherever. I just want him to be my Lord and I ask him to forgive me today and be my Lord and Savior. If that's your prayer, eyes closed, nobody looking around, just slip your hand up and put it down and I'll see it and we'll agree in prayer that you'll experience the love and the forgiveness of Jesus. If you're here today, just quickly, private, private, just nobody looking around but you and me. Just slip your hand up. Lord, thank you for what you've done in our hearts today. And we consider it a privilege to be part of your church, an honor. And I pray that you'll just do great and mighty things in the days and weeks and months ahead. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Come on, let's give the Lord a big hand. Thank you, Pastor Noel. Wasn't that good? Can we give him another round of applause this morning? You know, I, I'm always convinced that God's doing a special, got a special word for us when you come here. So <laughs> I appreciate that. And, Thank you. And even sitting here this morning, hearing for myself the call of a fresh opportunity to be, to serve his kingdom, to serve this community, to serve this, you know, church and to serve uh, our state and our nation right here in this body uh, a fresh opportunity to be a servant. You know, I, I wrote that down, and I felt like that was for me to hear this morning. So thank you for being faithful to the Lord. Yeah. Well, let's do this. Let's all stand up together. And before you are dismissed, there are two things to remember. So Tuesday night, you tell the person next to you, Tuesday night, be here. I didn't hear anybody say it. Let's try that again. Tuesday night, be here, 715, nights of transformation. And you know, if you are looking for breakthrough, when we put our, ourselves aside and we come seek the face of the Lord, there's breakthrough in there. And that's what we are doing here on Tuesday night. So please join us. And if you're new, we have a gift for you in the back. And if you see somebody who's new, you make sure you corral them, hug them, and take them straight to the back to get their gift. And with that, God bless you. Enjoy your day. And we love you all.